care of the, um, the other business here. I'm just going to say everyone. Very good. Very good. All right. I will share my screen and tell me if you're seeing the slide deck. I am. All right. Then. Uh, this presentation is one bite at a time, deleting millions of rows from production systems. I rather like that subtitle. It sounds so dangerous to be deleting millions of rows. Um, bit about me, I am, I've am. i been working with SQL Server for about 20 years. I started um, teaching certification classes in the community college. I've worked at Microsoft for 10 years. I've always loved um, working on performance cases. It's been the, It's the thing that I always gravitate to is performance issues. Um, I just changed jobs a few months ago, so I'm getting the lay of the land where I am and looking for uh, performance problems and long running queries I can dig into and start beating on. And um, I have been blogging for the last couple of years, um, sqljared.com if you want to go follow up on any of them. And if you are on base, if you're on Twitter or Blue Sky or any other of the social uh, media places where the SQL people hang out, um, SQL Jared is uh, who I am, and you can find me pretty much anywhere by that handle. Um, so the genesis of this was kind of an kind of interesting. Uh, this came from work that I did several years ago, and what had happened was we had just done a round of uh, anonymization for like GDPR or CCPA issues. So we had just done some data anonymization work and set up a system for that. And as of afterwards, one of my colleagues came to me from the BI team and said, hey, um, all these rows that you're updating when you're anonymizing data, it's coming back through our system again. And we're seeing a lot of, we're looking at a lot of that data as it goes by. And should we have, you know, rows in these table from like 2010 and 2004? And the answer was very quickly, uh, no, we shouldn't. We're hopefully deleting those long before then. And what we found when we got to looking into it is that we had uh, we had a lot of processes that are trying to delete old data from some of our uh, very large tables, and these processes weren't performing well. So they weren't failing. They were just operating very, very slowly, and they were never going to catch up. And so this kicked off about six months of work for us to go through and find all these processes and and kind of tune them or rewrite them and uh, in in the process of this our largest largest database went from being about 20 terabytes in size to about 12 terabytes in size so a lot of this is about kind of lessons that were learned uh, during that process and things that uh, that are associated with it um, batching major operations like this the purpose is to take uh, a really large task that you want to accomplish and turn it into uh, much smaller, uh, a, a series of much smaller operations, mainly so that we don't have a lot of blocking or a lot of interruption of service or lock escalation that results in an entire table being unavailable. Um, I will talk a lot about garbage collection in this, so deleting old data that we no longer need to retain in our system, but the same sort of lessons can be applied to archiving data or backfilling new columns or managing uh, personally identifiable information, and other things like just batching incredibly large queries or reports against your OLTP environments. So, um, so let's do a little bit of foundation work. A lot of these queries and a lot of the things I'm going to be do are going to be queries that use the top operator. This is how we we limit the scope of our operations. So, what does an efficient uh, execution plan that's using the top operator look like? Um, well, here's an example here. This is a pretty simple query going against a table in the wide world importers database. And if we're operating in, in row mode, so normal execution, 
what's happening is we've got multiple operations going on at one time. Uh, the first thing that's really going to happen here logically is this index seek against the order lines table. But as we are retrieving rows from that operator um, and those rows go up to our nested loops operator, we're going to take those kind of one at a time and start doing key lookups against the clustered index to get the rest of the information we want. Once that information has been joined together, we're, we're going to pass them up one row at a time up to the top operator. So this, this all keeps going and it's being driven really from the top down. So the select operator is saying, hey, give me some rows. And the top operator is doing the same thing to the, to the nested loop operator beneath it. Hey, give me some rows. And every time the top operator basically asks for more rows, the nested loops operator does what it does and, and uh, activates the things underneath it. And so the top operator doesn't know what's happening underneath it. Just all it's, it's just asking for data. Well, the, the query keeps executing, of course, until the top operator has received however many rows it's calling for. In this example, it's calling for 100 rows. Once it gets that, that uh, 100th row, it stops asking for new information from the nested loops below it. And so at that point, we shouldn't be doing any more work. And in this case, you can see we actually read 149 rows or we returned 149 rows from the order lines table. And then when we do our key lookup, we returned only 100 from this. We joined and returned 100 rows and that shut down the operation. So this is kind of what we expect it to look like. Uh, we can see that we 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 returned more rows here, which then got filtered out later when we were doing our key lookup. But we only re we only did the minimal amount of work we had to to get 100 rows and pass them on. And there are some some common caveats and some things that we need to look out for, um, specifically blocking operators, sort operations, and something I like to call uh, conflicting criteria. So what are they? What are blocking operators? This is a funny one. This is actually the first thing I ever blogged about, like in 2019. And it was um, <laughs> at this point I had already I had already left Microsoft. I had worked at Microsoft for 10 years. I had left, and we actually engaged uh, Grant Fritchie uh, to come and talk with us about work uh, at at Channel Advisor when I worked at Channel Advisor uh, about some of the work we were doing involving Query Store and 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 some of our operational things. And as we were talking about one performance example he had, he he was he was talking about the uh, the flow of this execution plan, and he mentioned, and of course this is a blocking operator, and and he went on, and I had to kind of stop and I said, what what's what's a blocking operator? And I had at this point been working with SQL Server probably for 15 years, and I had never heard that term used. So this is the first thing that I actually blogged about when I started my own blog. Um, blocking operators inhibit the normal flow of our execution plans because things can't operate in a row mode anymore. Um, a blocking operator can't function in, until it receives all of the information that should be coming to it. Um, example is like a sort operation. You can't sort one row at a time. You can't sort part of the data that's going to come back from a given table. You have to get all of the rows and have all of them at one time so that you can sort them and put them in the proper order. Um, hash matches are also blocking operators, but it's really on that first table. It has to retrieve all the information from the first table in a hash match join so that it can build its hash table. Um, eager spool operators are another one that you'll see often. Anything that's a remote operation um, and also scalar aggregates. But the main thing you're going to have to watch out for are sorts, eager spools, and hash matches. And I've got some links in here to my to my uh, blog post. I also have this slide deck available online and uh, on GitHub, and I can point you to that later. So in addition to watching out for blocking operators, uh, one thing that I refer to is conflicting criteria. And I see this a lot. So typically we use an index for one of two reasons. Either the index, the, the, the query that we're trying to run has a where clause and our where clause, um, we're filtering on, the, uh, on columns that are in a given index. So we'll use that index. The other use for indexes is that they have information in order. So if your query is trying to return information in a specific order, 
It could use the index that corresponds with that order. Um, but we, you don't get to have both. <laughs> so obviously, if you have uh, a filter that's on one set of columns and you are ordering things based on another set of columns, which index is it going to use? Because it can't use both and neither is going to do both jobs. So with that, let's go and flip over to some examples. So I've already restored the wide world importers database and I've got a few indexes I am going to create just for the sake of my examples later on, and that's all good. So let's look at a couple of execution plans. This is a very simple one indeed. Here I'm doing a query against sales order lines. I've got a couple things in my where clause and I'm returning my top 100 rows. And this is pretty simple and straightforward. We, were, we actually read about 900 rows, but we're filtering out most of them because of the predicate on unit price. But this operation, there's way more than 100 rows of data that meet this criteria. But we read the first 100 that match our criteria, we pass it on to the top operator, and that shuts down the operation. And this is kind of how things should operate. Now, I'm going to actually put this index hint back in place. Here's a slightly more complicated example. Here we're doing a key lookup. This is actually what was in my slide deck. We retrieve 149 rows from our non-clustered index that's based on, let's see, that's based on the order ID on the order lines table. And then we do a key lookup to get the rest of the information we need for this query and include, we filter out by the quantity. So we end up with 100 rows from this key lookup operator and we pass that on and the operation shuts down. And keeping, and like I said, keeping these operations small is our goal so we want things to complete as as quickly as possible and with as little wasted effort as possible here's a more complicated one so here i'm joining orders and order lines and i've got a couple criteria so if i so this operator actually has this execution plan has a blocking operator in it, and we're doing more work because of that we have a hash match join between these two that's what sql server said and we get hinted out of that behavior and there are ways to deal with this, but first you've got to be aware of what you're looking for. Here we do a clustered index seek against the orders table, but we're actually retrieving about 5,000 rows. We're retrieving everything that meets this criteria to begin with so that we can build our hash table. Now, once we have that, we actually go and we hit uh, the sales order line table to get the rest of the information we need for our query. And even though we're only doing a top 100 here, we retrieve 900 rows from this clustered index scan, and we return 900 rows from the hash match. And that's a little weird, but that's because this operator is actually operating in batch mode. So after we've built our table, we actually ask this operator to operate in batch mode and give us 900 rows and that's why the behavior is a little different here now i mentioned conflicting criteria so let's take a quick look at that now if i take out this comment i'm going to be filtering based on the order id and the quantity but i'm going to be ordering based on the last edited win uh last edited win field and here you can see that we're still we're still doing, we're retrieving the same amount of inf information to orders to build the hash table, but we're doing a lot more work on the order lines table so that we can retrieve all the information we need so that we can sort it properly to then get the 100 rows that we actually want. So we're, we're, we're going through these, we're, we're filtering based on our where clause and using indexes that are based on that but we have to do more work because we're telling it to sort the information uh, before the query is complete. Um, in this case, I would really want to encourage my whoever is, you know, whatever application is trying to retrieve this information to, uh, why don't you just run the query and then you guys can sort it once I've sent you the information and you can sort it however you want. Here's one more example, Let's see. I'm querying against sales order line. Okay, well, this is essentially the same thing. We can actually skip this. 
this is uh, again the same where clause, but with the order uh, with the order by clause included. And I've got a simple garbage collection process that I want to show you, so we will start with that. So here I'm creating a temp table called vehicle temperatures GC, and it's just taking in an integer and we are going to be working with the warehouse dot vehicle temperatures table. Now in this, I'm defining a batch size of 100. I'm going to begin a transaction just for the sake of my examples here and not to actually delete all the data in this table. I'm going to tell it to insert into my temp table the identifiers for each row. We're only going to get one batch of them. And I'm going to be looking for anything that has a recorded win date that's more than 50 months old. And I've actually got an index hint in here just to make sure this behaves like I expect. So once we identify these rows, we're going to put that information into our temp table. And then we're going to use that to delete data out of the base table. So if I run that, we can take a quick look at the execution plan. And here you can see we hit the vehicle temperatures table, we return 100 rows, we're computing some scalars, and we hit our top operator and it shuts down. So we got our data very quickly. And then in our delete operator, we're doing an index scan against the temp table, but I'm not too worried about that. We know there's a limited amount of data there. And then we join over to the vehicle temperatures table. We only return 100 rows and this select this uh, sort over here is actually because we want to get the right identifiers to actually delete the correct rows, but we're not we're not returning any more than 100 rows, so we're not doing anything really extraneous here. Although we can write this a little more simply, and we'll do that in this example. Here, I'm again defining my batch size, and I'm beginning a transaction. And here I've just got a delete top statement. I've got my top clause directly in my delete. I specify my my date range, and this works just fine as well. And you can see we've got an index seek against vehicle temperatures. We actually only read 100 rows, we returned 100 rows, and we're done. Now, if you take this, you can actually do loops. So let's say you want to delete more than 100 rows. Well. We, but we want to keep our operations small at the same time. Well, what can you do? Well, you can make a loop that instead of you know trying to delete a million rows at one time and potentially locking the table, let's just delete 100 at a time. And let's maybe say, let's just delete rows for the next five seconds. But we'll do it in small operations each time. We probably won't block anything because we're locking a small amount in each transaction. And we won't keep a, and, and uh, we'll have a very quick operation that has little impact. So here we've got a batch size, a duration, an end date. I'm calculating the end date based on the current date. And my while loop, I say, in this while loop, I'll say while the current date is less than the end time I calculated, we're going to keep doing these delete operations however many times we can in that five seconds. And we're deleting one batch of rows from this table based on this date. If our row count from that operation comes back at zero, well, obviously there was nothing to delete, in which case we can just stop and we can exit out of the while loop. So let's run that. Let's see, I said that for five seconds. Wonder how many of these we'll get through. Hmm. Ah, we got through 41 batches. So we deleted 4,100 rows in that amount of time. And each of these, the execution plan is basically the same, and it's simple, and we got through that very quickly. So 41 batches. Um, and there's a couple things we could actually do differently about this. For one, if our row count is zero, obviously we didn't find anything else to delete. But really, if our row count is less than our batch size of 100, if we deleted 95 rows, then obviously there weren't any more that met our criteria and we can just stop at that point. 
Is there a question? Okay. One other thing I would say is in this case, we really don't need to have a transaction here. Having a transaction outside of the while loops means that even though we did a small operation for each individual delete, we were we were locking an increasing amount of the table each time. So if we if there was a situation where we would need a transaction, I'd probably want it to be beginning and committing inside the while loop so that each operation is is distinct from the others. So that is a pretty simple um, garbage collection process. And I've got some some strategies and some suggestions to make pretty much in general. One is to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, when we had this, when we launched this effort of going through all of our old GC processes and cleaning them up, one of the worst ones I saw, and I was in e-commerce at this point, so one of these was dealing with our main inventory table, which uh, a lot of customers provide information about all the items that they have for sale, and we have most of that in one big table, but a, a series of tables that are kind of directly related to that we're also cleaning up at the same time. And what was bad about it is the logic was so terribly complicated. And there were there were layers and layers of it. If you remember, say, big O notation, it was like at least big O into the third what they were doing <laughs> when they wrote the stored procedure. Um, for fear of having too many uh, rows in an operation at a time, they were doing things like only trying to get a hundred, only trying to get a hundred or a thousand rows, but starting only with rows or, or items that had an item ID that ended in the digit nine. So like we're only trying to look at a tenth of the table at a time, but it was it was having a it was having negative consequences because say looking for an ID value, but then modding it by 10, that's not really chargeable. So in the attempt to make sure we're not doing too much of the table at once, making it much, we were, we, were, we, we had made it more complicated and thus it was just scanning the table anyway. So um, my, my garbage collection process here, this while loop, this is really simple and it's doing the job I want and there's not a lot of extraneous stuff in the way. The more you keep things simple, the better off you'll be. Um, transactions is necessary. If you don't need transactions, don't use them. Um, there are cases where you definitely might. If you're trying to say delete data from multiple tables, you, you can definitely ask yourself, well, if I delete data from the first three tables and then we try to delete data from the fourth and something fails, do I really want to roll back and put the data back in table one, two, and three? Because it might, it, it might be the case. It might be that your application will see the absence of that data, uh, say the absence of line item data for a given order, and it, and it might throw errors at your application level. So maybe you need to make sure you delete the whole thing as one unit. Um, but in other situations might not. So it's really good to ask yourself, do we nearly, really need transactions? at all and if you do it would be better to do them like i just said in the in my uh, example to do them within your while loop within whatever looping you've got going on so that you uh don't have one truly massive transaction that's the sort of thing we're trying to avoid stop when you can um think about ways in which you can be sure that you you know you're already done with the job for example, if we didn't delete any rows or if we didn't delete a full batch of rows, oh, well, obviously there's nothing else to, to, to operate on, so we can stop for now. Consider the negative. Um, this is a weird one. So sometimes when you're, when you're running a query like this that's using the top operator, um, you really need to stop and think, well, how is this going to perform when there aren't any more rows that meet my criteria? Um, because you may look at you may look at this in test and you may have a query that's actually doing say a table scan but it's not causing any performance problems because it if it's trying to delete 100 rows and you're doing a table scan but it finds those 100 rows quickly then it's going to stop it's not going to scan the whole table so it won't be nearly as bad an operation when there are things to delete once you've say caught up and deleted all the old records out of the table 
if it's doing a table scan and it's not finding things uh, to delete and passing those on to that top operator, it's going to keep reading until it finds them. So at that point, you may find that you've you've caught up the operation and now your your GC process is taking a lot more time and consuming a lot more CPU. Uh, test your batch size. So in in those examples, I was uh, deleting 100 rows, and maybe it would be more performant to do a larger batch. Maybe I could do a thousand rows in slightly more time. Uh, you test with that parameter sometime, you might find that it makes a big difference in, in how efficient you are and how many rows you're operating on in a given time. And also, I like parameterizing. I like making procedures um, to do my GC, and I like them having parameters so that hopefully I can just you know it change uh, parameters as the situation calls for. If we've gotten a huge influx of data, in a specific area and that, or on, a, or on a specific database, and I need to do more aggressive cleanup, I can say, uh, extend the duration uh, for how often we're going to run this job, or I can do larger batches, or I can yeah. change as our business needs change or as our, our, our decisions change about our data retention period, I can change the window of how long we're keeping our data. And having, the, having it properly parameterized, parameterized will make all of that a lot easier. So now let's look at a more complicated GC process. All right, this is going against the orders table primarily, but we've got some foreign key relationships. So we're going to look at, we're gonna to try to delete 100 rows. We're gonna give this thing 30 seconds potentially, and we're gonna to try to delete everything that's older than 50 months old. I'm creating two temp tables, one for order IDs and one for invoice IDs. And here, I'm going to find the end time based on whatever my duration parameter is. And while we haven't run out of time, we're gonna truncate my attempt tables. I'm going to determine if there's already a transaction. So if we're already inside some kind of transaction, perhaps from the, the application or job or whatever that called uh, this stored procedure, then I'm not going to create a new one. But otherwise, we'll create one within the loop. So we'll, we're going to transact each uh, iteration of this operation. So we're looking for any orders that are older than 50 months or whatever the parameter comes in as. So I'm just getting the order IDs and I'm putting them in my temp table. I'm doing this because we're gonna be cleaning up from multiple tables. And since the, we have foreign key relationships, I can't delete them from orders until I've deleted them from say order lines and the invoices table. So we're gonna get all of our order IDs and throw them into a temp table first. Then we're gonna delete from the order lines table. And we're going to be joining from our temp table to order lines based on the order IDs. And notice I've got a top clause here when we identify our order IDs. I don't have a top clause when I'm deleting from sales order lines. Why is that? Well, these are not necessarily one-to-one -one and they're likely not one-to-one, -one, right? Uh, a given order can have multiple items in them. So we might be deleting 100 orders. We might be deleting 300 order lines. My filter and my limiter really here is the contents of that temp table. Once we've deleted order lines, we actually are going to populate a second temp table with invoice IDs. So we're deleting things that are related to orders, which includes invoices, but the invoices have several related tables as well. And I specifically commented here the top clause. We really want to delete everything that relates to those invoice IDs and or the uh, order IDs. And I do believe the orders and the invoices are one-to-one, -one. but it, it doesn't make sense for us to have a top clause here. We've already got the list of order IDs that we care about. Let's get everything that relates to those order IDs and because we need to make sure all of that is deleted before we can delete the order. So here I'm populating the second temp table and I'm using the invoices GC temp table to delete from customer transactions, stock item transactions, and invoice lines. Once that's complete, then we can go back and delete from the invoices table itself 
and then orders. And at that point, we will commit our transaction if we created one locally. So, and I'm going to run this and I'm not going to run it for 30 seconds. I'm just going to run it for five, but we'll probably want to take a quick look at the execution plans and make sure things are going all right. All right, so let's see what we got. Here, our first query, we do a constant scan. That's us doing our date math. And then we hit the orders table. We only return 100 rows. Pass that on. Everything's working as we expect. We've got a scan against our orders temp table, but again, that's expected. We've got 100 rows. We return that. We get 215 rows out of the order lines table. Like I said, they're not one to one. And we delete that without any issues. Scrolling further down, and it is very good before, however correct we think our design is, let's definitely test these things out, right, before we send them on, because the optimizer can always surprise us with our execution plans. We get 100 rows out of our orders temp table, we get 100 invoices, we pass that on, and in the next three tables, we are deleting from customer transactions, no problems here. We do have a sort before our delete here, but we only returned 100 rows to get up to that point. 215 stock item transactions, 215 invoice lines. Now at this point, we get back to the invoices table. We've deleted everything related to it. And you can see, we get 100 rows out of our temp table. We only get 100 from invoices. We have a sort before our delete, and then we have a little more work here. So if you're confused as to what this is, after we've deleted from invoices, we check customer transactions, invoice lines, and stock item transactions. What are we doing? We're doing an assert check to make sure we haven't violated our foreign key constraint. That's the whole reason we had to delete from those tables before we deleted from invoices, right? Well, this is just SQL Server checking up. So if you've never seen uh, what, what a foreign keys implementation in your execution plan looks like, that's what it looks like. And once we have deleted from invoices, we can delete from orders as well. And we also have to do an assert check against that. I think we have a foreign key on the invoices table, but I think there's a local foreign key as well. That's why there's two checks here. So all that looks good. We, we don't seem to be wasting any effort anywhere. And we got through, what is this? Ah, we did like four batches of that in five seconds. Uh, the, the foreign key checks definitely slow us down as we're having to do a bunch of extra reads for that. Any questions about this so far? All right then. Um, okay. Another topic. So updates. I've been talking mainly about garbage collections. I've been really talking about deleting data and identifying things that we're going to delete. Um, updates are a little different for a couple reasons, but there are processes that you would want that you would definitely want to do. Um, that would be update operations and not deletes. So before we did all this work, I had just done a bunch of anonymization work uh, to remove personally identifiable information from our system. And that's going to be an update, right? We're not going to delete the entire record, but if it's something from an old transaction, I don't need your shipping address anymore, right? So you're going to be either anonymizing or obfuscating data. If So if you're dealing with PII, you're going to be having update statements. One of the things you can run into with them is that they can get progressively slower. Um, I like to think of them as not being self-cleaning. And my next example is dealing with that. So I am going to see. Let's start off with this. Let's say I'm looking at invoices, and I want to look for invoices that are older than 90 days. Okay. Um, but and I'm looking for delivery instructions. So when you're thinking about PII, you do have to think, you do have to be suspicious of kind of anything that has a text field in it. And there might be other things that we care about as well that could be numerical phone numbers, what have you. But one thing to be uh, concerned about is any text field, and especially anything that a customer can write data in. So in this case, 
I'm going to make sure we don't have anything left in our delivery instructions field because our customers get to control that field and I don't know what they're going to put in there. So let me just run this query to, no, yes, run this query because a good starting point for anything is to make sure that you can actually run a select query against uh, whatever your criteria is. So let's start with that. I want to get a thousand rows from the invoices table based on the last edited win date and the de delivery instructions. So if we look down here, this is one of the things I was telling you about earlier. Okay, we only read, we only returned a thousand rows. It went on. We did an additional filter. It hit the top clause. Great. We turned a thousand rows and not, you know, a million rows. But the problem here is we are doing an index scan. So we're not seeking an index. I really would have thought that we'd be doing some kind of an index seek. Okay, delivery instructions is not null. Is not going to be great for us. But this last edited win, we should be using that field, right? Why are we not using that field? Do we do we just not have an index on that? I'm betting we don't. So if I come over here, let's see. Yeah, let's create an index on last edited win. And in fact, let's include delivery instructions. That sounds great. So let's go back and run our query again and see what this looks like. Okay, we've got a constant scan. Okay, this is again us doing date math. But then we do an index seek here. We return a thousand rows. Actual number of rows for all executions, estimated number of rows read. Da, 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 da. Why is it not actually telling me the, I'm not seeing the actual number of rows read, but I'm assuming it's not much more than a thousand. Oh, actual number of rows for all execution is a thousand. Okay. So we read a thousand rows. All of this data is old. We return them. Uh, we do a filter here looking for rows where the delivery instructions are not null. So we're doing that after the fact. Fine. And we have a thousand rows hit our top and then it shuts down the operation. Okay, great. We should be in good shape to actually do some cleaning up here. So I'm just writing a while loop. I haven't actually written a procedure here yet. I'm going to say, let's do batches of a thousand rows and let's try to delete 50,000. That's going to be my end condition here. And I'm going to keep track of how many rows we've actually updated with each operation. So let's see how this works. Or did I highlight that? Yeah, it's not going to like that. Let's try that again. Okay. So as this goes through, it's going to find rows. It's going to pass them on up the chain. We're going to update those rows and update our count, loop back through. So this is complete now. Let's see. We were going to delete 50,000 rows. We did 50 batches. Great. But what is going on here? We've got a very fat line coming off of our invoices table. So we didn't just return a thousand rows. We returned 50,000 rows from this. And our join returned 50,000 rows as well. But our filter only returned a thousand. So what is going on here? Now that filter operation again is us checking for delivery instructions. So we returned 50,000 rows from our index seek before we got 1,000 rows that we passed on to our top operator. What happened is this. The first time we ran, hmm, hold on, so I'm scrolling strangely. something weird going on here. Um, the first time we ran the operation, we found a thousand rows that met our criteria. So we updated those by setting the delivery instructions to null. That's one way to make sure that there's no personally identifiable information, right? So we found the thousand rows, we anonymized them, great. The second time we ran our loop, it goes and it reads the first thousand rows that are within our date range. And None of them have delivery instructions. So it has to read another thousand rows to find things for us to actually update. The third time, we're going to have to read 2,000 rows that are all that all have blank delivery instructions before we can find a thousand rows for us to anonymize. Each time we run this, we're getting slower. 
because we're having to read past rows that we've already anonymized. So each batch of this gets slower and slower. Well, how do we deal with that? Well, one way to do that is to use a filtered index. And I don't use filtered indexes often, but this is a really good case for them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make an index based on last edited win, but it will only have rows where the delivery instructions have not already been set to null. So if I do this, and I rerun this process, then when we do that last iteration, we get down to it, we should see that we're still operating on a thousand rows. We, there won't be anything on in our index that we don't care about. So the first thousand rows that we meet that are in our date range will be the only ones that we have to read. We'll anonymize them and we'll be done. So the, my, my thought about this is why I was developing this for our own anonymization process is that, there, that our, our delete processes delete the rows we care about, but our updates are not self-cleaning. So the filtered indexes were the solution to that. All right. I got, I got Since a we got a question here, uh, Jared. What have uh, you got? You can tell me if you're going to cover this later, but what if you wanted to make every row in a, a large, large, one particular column you wanted to wipe out to null in every single row? What's the fastest way to do that? Because I have one table when it was on premise, it took seconds. And when I put okay. it in the cloud, it took five minutes. And I don't know why. Same query, same table. Okay. So you want to null out that entire that entire column. Like all rows? Are we just all like drop are are we dropping the column? What's what's the deal? Uh I'm I'm doing a a refresh of calculations, and I don't know which rows are going to ultimately be null again or have a value. Okay. Um, if you were wanting to clear out everything in the table, um, it might not be exactly the same, but it's another situation where I'd, I'd think, hey, let's just, uh, I think it's pretty similar. If you had a filtered index on that column, you could tell it to do the same thing. Start deleting a thousand rows at a time. And if we don't want, we don't want to like lock up the entire table and make the table essentially unavailable for five minutes while we're doing this. A small iterative process like this can do the same thing. And again, a filtered index wouldn't be bad here. Part of the advantage with filtered indexes um, with a situation like this is first it's gonna it's gonna be a larger index and it's gonna have all this information with it, right? But as you start updating things and those rows no longer meet the criteria, they'll be taken out of the index. So your index is getting progressively smaller as time goes on as this operation is catching up. Um, I'd probably do something very similar to what I just showed you uh, in that last example. Um, probably need more information to, to to come up with anything else, but that should be a good start. I'll give it a whirl. Thanks. All right. Anything else? All right, then. Where is, there we are. One more example. So a lot of these, I'm dealing with date ranges. And date ranges are inequality queries, and we don't see those quite as often as we're looking for equalities, right? So there's one thing I wanted to bring up, and that's the 30% estimate. There's an, this is the 30% estimate is something that SQL Server does uh, when it's basically guessing because there aren't usable stats available for it. Um, this may only apply when you're dealing with things like local variables. Uh, there are other examples. I know that, uh, say, not temp tables, but table variables, SQL Server will assume there's only one row inside them. Um, well, when you're when you're doing a query based off of local variables, it doesn't know how many rows are likely to apply to that local variable. And so it kind of makes a blind guess as to how many rows are going to be returned. Now, it'll base that off of statistics if you're doing, say, an equality for a given column, because if it's got statistics for that column, it can make that kind of judgment. It can say, 
oh, if it's he, he's he, it's equal to a specific value. Oh, this this column is unique. I know he's only going to return one row here. Oh, this column that might be like ten rows. Okay, I'm going to make an execution plan based around that. And the more criteria you have in a query, the more likely it's going to be able to use one or multiple of them to make some actual uh, estimates based on statistics. But when it doesn't have a way to make that judgment and you're using an inequality query, it's going to assume it's going to return 30% of the table. This is going to lead us down the path of execution plans that are expecting to maybe do a table scan or hash matches or or require a really large memory allocation. So let's look at this. So I'm going to look at the orders table again. And let me run this query real quick. So I'm querying for the number of rows. I'm, I'm setting an archive date that's 70 months in the past. And I am going to query to see how many rows are basically within that date. That seems weird. My row counts are different than I'm expecting here. Let me do one other thing real quick. How many rows do we have in this? Hmm. Wondering if I actually deleted rows from some one of these tables in here. Let me do. Give me just a moment to clean up a bit. I might have to reload. Sorry about this. I'm going to restore this from back up again just so my row counts aren't completely off because that's going to confuse me. All right, let's try this again. So if I run this query, okay, there's 73,595 rows within my date range. Now, if I run this query, it says I've got 73,000. 595 total rows in the table. 30% of that would be right around 22,000. So let me run the query above two ways. First, the first way is I'm running this query and I'm telling it to filter for rows where the order date is less than this calculated value. So let's run this and I'm gonna get the execution plan and we'll see the difference momentarily. So, okay, we did a clustered index scan. We returned the entirety of the table and everything is outside of the date range. So everything in this table is outside of the date range. So that's that's expected and you can see that the, the estimate here is accurate. What if I change that though? here and you can see I calculated or I, I created a variable up here with the date and then I calculated that value and stored it in the local variable. If I run the query this way, we still return the same information. We still return the same number 73,595. But if I look here, the one big difference is this. It returns 73,595 rows, but our estimate is way off. Well, why is our estimate off by so much? This time I'm operating based on the variable instead of on the calculated value. And SQL Server doesn't know uh, how many rows are likely to be returned by an inequality based on that variable. It's, it's guessing how many rows it's going to return, and that's why the estimate is so far off. And you can see, that the 22,000 number is equal to 
30% of the table. So in this case, it doesn't matter much to us. Our execution plan comes back the same either way. But in other cases, this right this might really matter because the difference uh, or the 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 difference in the number of rows that it's estimating is going to affect how it creates your execution plan. If it thinks we're going to return 30% of the table, frequently SQL Server is just going to scan the table. But I tend to do this much more often when I'm doing, say, date range based things because SQL Server can actually estimate the statistics based on this when it's calculating the value on the fly. So here you're more likely to get an accurate estimate, and that may give you a better execution plan than in the alternative. If you want to see any of these examples, you can go to my GitHub, um, and it's my handle again is SQL Jared. You can go to github.com slash SQL Jared, and I've got this and actually slide decks from my other presentations. And these examples are all based on wide world importers. So you could go through these and uh, take a look at the execution plans yourself <coughs> later if you would like. And you can follow up with me if you have any questions, or you can check out my blog and see if there's anything else there you might find interesting. Any other questions? I think we're good, Jared. Okay. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for You're presenting. Welcome. I have specific numbers here in my slide deck, and I wonder when, like, the sales dot orders table got smaller. Right. I must have made a mistake somewhere, but I restored from backup, and it's still the same number. I'm very confused. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, I appreciate getting the chance to talk. This is actually the second user group I've talked to this week. I talked to our local group on Tuesday. Oh, cool. Well, I put the uh, I put github.com slash SQL Jared out here on the, uh, um, the meeting chat. So I'll also have this uh, recording um, put up on our uh, put up on our uh, website under resources, and I'll right. add I'll add the link to uh, GitHub. There as well. And now I know who stole SQL Jared or who had it, shouldn't say stole, but who had it first. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure when I looked for it, I was like, oh man, who is this other Jared that does SQL? Oh, have, you, have you actually seen that? I was going to say, yeah, there's. there's. Oh, we lost you. Yeah. You went silent on us. We can and, still see uh, you talking, but lost your vocals. You lost my vocals? Oh, OK, well, just thanks again for having me tonight. I hope you picked up something useful from that. And uh, I'll see you guys around at a conference sometime. All right. All right. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Jared. Have a good night. Thanks, sir. All right. Our, um, we'll stop the, uh, stop the recording here. Our next, uh, our next meeting is uh, going to be uh, next month.